Hello, and welcome to the Painted Bright Quarterly Slush Pile. We are so glad that you're listening in today. Um, what you're about to listen in on, in on is an editorial meeting, and we are going to discuss the work of John Silby Williams, and we're very excited about that. So we have a nice a nice little crew today. I'll start with myself. I'm Kathleen Volk Miller, and um, I'm going to, I guess this time, let's stay in America. We'll stay in America and we'll bounce up to New York. Hi, Jason. Hi, I'm in New York. Um, all is well here. It's going to get really, really cold. And um, I'll send it to Canada. Daphne. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I'm up here in Canada, uh, just outside the capital, Ottawa, and it is already deeply cold here. So oh. I will, you're very chilly. Bounce it over to Marion. Oh. <laughs> And, and warm warm greetings from Abu Dhabi, um, where I was just going to advise everybody should be drinking whiskey to keep warm against the cold, but that's probably a bad idea for most people at, you know, 11 a.m., um, which is what we're recording. Um, if you and, have anything to do later. <laughs> seriously. And I'm going to bounce it over to Samantha. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm in Baltimore, and the weather report here is that it's going to be <laughs> kind of um bright winter days which it's getting colder which I'm so happy about because yesterday it was 84 degrees and it was 84 it was 84 degrees I was walking on Hopkins campus and the magnolia trees are starting to bud I can see the them coming out of their their little sacks which is alarming um but my students love it. They're all in shorts and happy, and <laughs> but not me. I like the winter and the cold. <laughs> do Do you remember, Kathy? Your boy went to that like um, podcasting conference, and it was totally zombie apocalypse because it was like 120 degrees in Philadelphia. Yes, yeah. Like just no one was outside. It was just like no it was one so was awful. Yeah, it was like the hottest day in 20 years or something. It was. It was like literally... a preview of lockdown. Yeah, yeah he's right. A hundred percent. We, we were just water. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, but I'm also shocked not to stay on weather, but it was 70 in Philadelphia. I can't believe you were 14 degrees warmer in Baltimore. Jason, what was it in New York? Uh, like in the forties. It, 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 it was, it was pretty chilly. Yesterday. It was not. Yeah. Yesterday was like not warm. I needed my gloves. Wow. Wow. That's really crazy. We're usually all closer together, you know. Talia, hello to you. Hi, I'm Talia Thomas. I'm here in uh, West Philly. And as you did say, the weather is bouncing. Like it's right, <laughs> right now it is in the 40s, but yesterday it was in the high 70s, but it's yeah. still very nice and sunny outside. Yeah. So uh, now that we now that we have dated the podcast, <laughs> well, I guess we should uh, get into the work. Um, Let's do it. So- so let's do it. And you know what, Jason, you do it. You seem very, okay. you're, you're like, you know, like I'm, I am champing at, at the, the gate, gym. man. You're champing. I am, I am champing. I at see. That uh, Huzzle. Uh, all right, we're jumping right in. Thank you, John Williams. Um, Huzzle for transparency for reflection. My ghosts breathe accusingly a winter mass, a mirror's impermanent erasure against shaving. I'm sorry from the face over my face in the glass. It's not just the birds, their bridge flight, the stains the sky wears today through this washable window, but my children's tiny hands absolving the glass. Of guilt? Of shame? Is it his blood raging generations through my veins or this whitewashed silence compelling me to pull our history face by face from its frames of glass? All this uneaten grain filling silo after silo, always at dusk in my mind, swarmed now with mealworms and mites and someone else's hunger, how it cuts the tongue like shards of glass. And those goddamn honeycombs failing again, our neighbors unable to keep his bees close enough to cultivate. Our house is a small box of dust and wing and against the glass, separating us from the world, curtains blur our reflections like rain, like stars cutting through cloud, a sustainable song. May my girls never be dead enough to fear themselves in our class. Woo. Beautifully read. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Listen, Jason, I was hoping that you might um, 
explain this form to my brother David. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> so um that's a thing we do now. Well, this is actually um, one of the oldest poetic forms still in use. It was developed in the 600s, if I recall correctly, or goes back to the 600s. It's an Urdu form that exists in um, Hebrew, in Arabic, um, in many, many different languages. And each couplet is distinct from each other couplet. So if you think about most of our poetry as kind of being linear, as following a meditation, as being a monologue, as being um, a story, the chazal resists all of those things. And each couplet begins again, but each couplet is defined by a refrain. So every couplet ends with the same word. So in this case, it's the word glass. And the couplets are unified by this ongoing meditation about whatever it is that consists or that makes up the refrain. And so the chazal, is a really exciting form for a lot of people who are used to form this kind of um, boxing them in or sort of making them do something uh, that they're used to doing while doing something else, like adding in the repetitions of a sestina or adding in the rhymes of a sonnet. Um, because the chazal says you have to keep starting over. So yeah. think about this idea in all these different ways. And you can see what happens in this poem is he keeps coming back to this idea of glass, right? And glass returns as a mirror, glass returns as a window, um, glass returns as a kind of coffin or a box. And that's really the power of the chazal is that it asks us to um, return to a single idea over and over again. The formal chazal does have a couple of requirements that this is not fulfilling. So mm -hmm. there is usually a rhyme before the refrain that is not observed here. Mm -hmm. um, and there is often an address to the self, which I guess does happen in this last chazal. Usually you would expect him to say like, John, you're this or that. Um, but talking about his girls is, is addressing himself as a father in that way. Um, mm -hmm. The chazal also has different pronunciations. So I learned the chazal from Agashah Ali, and he insisted that one had to say it chazal, but I've also spoken to Arabic speakers who say that it is pronounced chazal in um, Arabic. So depending on where your chazal comes from, you can say it in different ways. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, it was interesting, the whole when you were saying chazal, I kept thinking, I thought it was Hazal. I'm so glad Jason took the reins. Because, because I well, I corrected someone. I, yeah. I cor Shahid was so insistent. Because the, the other thing about the Hazal is that um, while the formal rules, all that stuff about the refrains and the rhymes and the self-address were known in English, they were forgotten. Um, but in the 1960s, there was a translation of, I want to say Khalid, um, and Adrian Rich wrote a number of free verse translations of Khaled's chazals and then wrote a number of her own free verse chazals. And so a lot of people then encountered the chazal just as disconnected couplets. And so there's also this English language tradition of the chazal as just disconnected couplets. Um, and you kind of have the option. Shahid was very insistent that these are real chazals and that those are by implication fake chazals, that the free verse chazal is a fake chazal. Um, um, I don't know where okay. I'd land on that, but I, I I corrected an Arabic speaker once. I was like, no, no, it's chazal. And he was like, yeah, buddy, in my language, chazal. So yeah, so I <laughs> open that permission to you. So listen, I have to, I'm, I'm loving one for the team there. about pronunciation too, because the Poetry Foundation um, for the definition of chazal says guzzle. <laughs> pronunciation <laughs> pronouncing the g right wow. like so and it's it, that's just a fast it's just like a you know the fascinating question of like pronunciation across these different forms right um right well we, we don't have a glottalized huh. i mean the the, mm -hmm. the glottalized it's like the h huh in bach is a glottalized yeah. k and so yeah. the glottalized g doesn't exist in english so what are you supposed to do yeah. Right. Um, in mm -hmm. Russian, like the word, there's no H sound in Russian. So it's alternately a H or a G. So like you, depending on where they brought in the transcription, it's a Gamborgor or a Hamborgor. Um, mm -hmm. Because for a long time, people thought the G sounded closer than the H sounded closer. So yeah, like it's, it's wonky. Like you're never going to, you know, sounds start really translate across 
languages. I'm sorry, I'm like being so pedantic today. Um, <laughs> I what, asked what for things, it. I asked what for it. One of the things I often talk to my students about in this question of like how sounds translate across language is that we often mystify mm -hmm. similar sounds. So if, if you think about like the R, right? We use the R sound in English, er is very close to the mouth and it's very open. In Spanish, er is trilled against the roof of the mouth. In French, you practically gargle it, like right? right like right. Um, in French, the, the R is all the way in the back. In Chinese, R is a vowel, right? It has duration, mm -hmm. er. So um, when we talk about moving sounds between languages, it's like the correct way to spell Hanukkah, you know, like with a set, right. like, you know, there's not, there isn't one. Um, there are only approximations. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the other thing I recently learned is that there was a kind of mania for um, standardization that kind of starts in the 1700s. And yeah. a lot of our ideas of correctness um, right. don't exist prior to this. I mean, Shakespeare spelled his name like some like, I don't know, 30 different ways or something. And um, so it's like he even used an X. And there wasn't a kind of um, desire for particularly nomenclature to be standardized and that, you know, yeah. people would just often use different names in different places. So if you want to say guzzle in English or guzzle or Ghazal or guzzle or whatever it is, um, we at PBQ welcome you to we use. It. <laughs> we love your yeah. voice, whatever your voice is, and you That's may right. go forth. And I have one last slushy. point, Jason. It, I don't see it here in the Poetry Foundation, but I also thought that a chazil was typically between five and maybe upwards of 15 couplets and that there was a range setting. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to get out my... Um, I, I don't have... Uh, I always refer back to Shahid's rules that he laid out in um, mm -hmm. uh, Ravishing Disunities, which is his anthology of chazil, real... I'm making quotation marks, real puzzles in English. Um, but yeah, five to 17. Like if you only have two, like. Yeah, it's not really. That's not really enough. No. Right. Yeah. But, but if you um, have like a hundred, I mean, I guess I can't, like no one can stop you. That sounds like it, any of the slushies listening to us right now, like that's a, that's a guzzle dare. <laughs> I'm going to stop reading at 15. <laughs> right? They're going to have to be really um, good if you want me to read past 15. Exactly. But mm -hmm. also slushies, we will put links to um, a number of the uh, sources and resources that we just mentioned in the show notes. Um, yeah. So we can you can click through and spend some time um, thinking about how uh, you've learned to pronounce things. Um, yeah, over, over I was going to say, I hope I hope that people, um, including my brother, David, appreciated that. And we've got two guzzle hazal hustles uh, by <laughs> John. So John, I hope you don't mind that we just went off like that, but I think it was, it was a good thing. It was, it was a little great talk. Jason, you will never remember this, but one time you came to speak at Drexel and for some reason, I think that was your own. You, you explained that this form to my students. Oh, I do remember that. That was in the bookstore, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah that was during was uh, the week of writing time. probably. Yeah. I think it was. I still have the part. poster in my office. Oh yeah. So do I. So I, I love that poster. Theme. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll put a link to the poster in the in the. Okay. Notes. So we go um, take a photo. We'll so, take a photo. <laughs> one of the things I really admire about this puzzle is the way the poet holds back on stating the name and and instead identifies the girls, like his daughters, as the sort of like iteration of self, right, um, or the invocation of self at the end of the poem, and it just makes a kind of like beautiful melancholy um come through in the in the poem um and that's you know everything from the, the sort of the image systems of of the glass the mirror um you know and sort of and the reflection of of the face uh but how that ties into a kind of um like a, a mood about legacy so it, it just struck me as as pretty fascinating yeah i I agree with that. And I also think how the title is working in terms of um, it's for trans transparency and for reflection. Uh, and thinking about that with glass, it feels like you're leaving out that one of, you know, for protection in a way. And I feel like protection from the elements or protection from other people or from feeling like that inside outsideness um, of life at once. And I think that's intentional that, you know, it, this is a poem that is 
uh, deciding not to go there, to not really think of the self in that way. And I love that about it. This poem kind of has me from my ghost breathe accusingly. It's just gorgeous. And then to end with that prayer slash wish for Mm -hmm. my girls is just gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. So slushies, we should also mention that you can go look at this poem. These lines are long. Jason, are the lines always long? They tend to be long. Um, Sean Head was very insistent that you should use some metrical structure, but people Mm -hmm. tend to use kind of a free verse structure. Yeah. Well, I I somehow, <clears throat> because they are so long and then you have that space and they're those couplets, I think it makes them be more substantive, these couplets on their own, right? Each one is pretty substantive, even though it's only a couplet, right? If it were a shorter line, it wouldn't be as dense and as much of a thing on, of its own, right? It's also doing so much with syntax. There's a lot of interruption. Um, the mm-hmm. way that the long lines, they're they're and dashes like all over this and all kinds of um, kind of starting the middle, right? Like a line that starts of guilt, question mark. And, you know, is that absolving the glass of guilt? Uh, probably not because the glass has a period after it, but then it does kind of run in. And so there's this really interesting way in which the very long lines are letting the syntax kind of break um, and connect in really interesting ways. Yeah. Maybe much harder in a shorter line. You'd be like Emily Dickinson, like it'd be, yeah. it'd be so um, compressed. Yeah. So I think I didn't finish the thought, and I don't know who's a new listener, but we we uh, publish the poems along with our show notes on the website, pbqmag.org, so you can go look at the poem and read it for yourself as well, as we discuss or after, or whenever you want. So I, I want to go back to that first line, KVM, because I'm with you. My ghost breathe accusingly is gorgeous. But then you've got that long dash, a winter mass, a mirror's impermanent erasure. Again, shaving, I'm sorry, from the face over my face in the glass. I I actually got thrown on uh, a winter mass. Um, and I wonder if anybody else did too, right? Like, And it, and it wasn't until I read past it right that I, I i i feel like i um came into the logic of the poem and then i'll and then i have a story about where my head went did anybody else like find winter mass? i just want the story about where your head went oh uh, <laughs> all right so I, uh-huh. all right plushies this is quick this is and kathy unless you have an answer no well i have no. a thought certainly no. not an answer so you go oh, <laughs> So I, I, I started the day talking prosody with a dear friend of mine who's, um, studies Victorian lit uh-huh. and, and long story short, we went all the way around from like iambic pentameter to dact- dactylic hexameter to rhyme of the ancient mariner to iron maiden who has an album rhyme of the ancient mariner. And I had no idea. So I was listening to metal at like 7 a.m. this morning, drinking coffee, thinking about how interesting that is in a, as an ekphrastic, right? And like this Iron Maiden doing Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So yeah. when I came to this poem right, <laughs> and saw a winter mass, my head immediately went to like Iron Maiden. I'm like, what kind of, what, like, is it black mass, winter mass? What's winter mass? Like, what, what's going on here? What's like the sort of like, is it like a religious thing or is it like, like, what is that? So I was baffled. And also it's been a day full of prosody. See also Iron Maiden. What's a winter mass? You, you know, at first I thought it meant a mass, like uh, as in substance, you know, as in a, a, a volume. But once I understood the poem better, I absolutely believe that it's a religious ceremony. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's legit. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And um, I think winter is just to tell us that it's winter. You know, it's a winter mass just feels different, right? Then to use winter as an adjective for the mass. Got it. It's it's just another wonderful thing, right? Because it makes you think of scarcity, right? Barrenness, white skies, right? Yeah, think, but even if it weren't actually winter, I mean, when you're in front of the glass, right, right 
there's breath on the glass mm -hmm. and that can happen, you know, depending on, you know, have you just had a shower, so on and so forth. Yeah. So, so, right, so right. Me, it also speaks to just my ghosts breathing accusingly. It's, it speaks to the breath. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Um, yeah. That's what I saw too. Yeah. yeah. I think That's I'm with beautiful. Maggie. I also think it goes with the creation of atmosphere there. I, I don't think I think of ghostiness yes. in the summer as much like hot ghosts. Like mm. I think I associate them with the winter. We need a podcast on hot ghosts. <laughs> hot hot ghosts. ghosts. Okay, is, that's uh, the title of the album. That's the title of the album. <laughs> oh, I thought it was the title of the episode. <laughs> okay, also the title of the episode, Hot Ghosts. That's great. Yeah, thank you. That That is very, it's helpful to hear you thinking about that and talking that through because it does like from the get, you have this sense of atmosphere in the poem that's really um, powerfully created in, in the mind. And although it's a puzzle for transparency or reflection, there's, there's much in it for me anyway, as a reader that's opaque, but opaque yeah. in a very welcome way because I want to keep going back and puzzling it out is, is there any moment that uh how about the questions in stanza three of well, guilt of yeah, shame is ab yeah absolutely I've got that underlined here and and is it his blood raging generations through my veins or this whitewashed silence and I'm still puzzling mm -hmm. yeah uh I'm not a fan of those kinds of questions. So the third stanza for me has a little is a little problematic. Does it slow you down a lot, Kathy? No, not really. I'm still very engaged. Yeah, okay. That's really helpful because it's in it's in the uh stanza before it that helps me with the winter mass, right? Um, because that is the ritual, right? So the tiny hands of the children of doing the te absolvo, right? Um, he's like imagining his children absolving him, right? Therefore, the next stanza of guilt of shame is asking of of what he's being absolved, right? Or yeah, because the so if if I'm understanding that that logic there, it's like like it's the it's it's their vision of his reflection that is the intersection, right? Right? They're seeing that reflection and absolving the glass, right? Um, which is really like a lovely sort of complicated uh, set of images. So the his is referring yeah. to the glass, him? You know, I don't, Sam, I, I, that almost sounds like a generational his to me, like maybe his father, right? Oh, okay. But I don't know. And then it then it's kind of dark, right? It, it, is it his blood raging generations through my veins or this whitewashed silence compelling me to pull our history face by face from it, its frames of glass? Like, I don't know who that his is, right? But in my, my, my mind thinks in terms of ancestors there. Yeah, because I wondered if there was a picture in the room as well. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So that being another face in a glass, but, but, but I don't know. And I don't mind not knowing. I, in fact, this kind of poem, I love not knowing everything. I feel like it's not, not, not for me to know in a way, but, but, <laughs> but, but you know, um, but the experience of it is, is yeah. so wonderful. And then we get into all this uneaten grain, like something that's not been processed, something that's sitting there waiting to be processed, filling silo right. after silo, that, always at dusk in my mind. And Dagny, it's swarmed now with mealworms and mites and someone else's hunger. It's mm -hmm. a horrifying image, right? Oh, like, it's awful. But super, like, wow, right? And so again, and that goes back to the his and the stanza before, right? Yes, I guess it does. You know, and it, it, in terms of mood, right? Like just in terms mm -hmm. of, there's mm -hmm. like an, there's a darker edge here. To this sort of lineage um, yeah and 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 then it builds into anger how it cuts yeah. the tongue like shards of glass and those goddamn honeycombs failing again and, and mm -hmm. again the again i mean i don't need to know it's obviously there's something there um 
but it I mean I, I I read that as like a like like a rise of anger do you yeah 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 and also like a very like um deft analogy between the the bees the beehive and the house right that he's mm-hmm. in our mm-hmm. house too is a small box of dust and wing and against the glass separating us from the world curtains blur our reflection like rain right and then mm-hmm. then they're back in the house proper but like that it's, mm-hmm. it's the way that hustles right across the images back into the house is really interesting yeah and immediately preceding that about how our neighbors unable to keep his bees close enough to cultivate kind of right. like keeping your children close enough to influence right. them in the right way mm-hmm. gosh guys we do have two more yes. i feel like yes. we could talk and talk and talk about this yeah. however um sort of feeling like maybe you should vote yeah only if i can read the last line may may my girls never be dead enough to fear themselves in our glass i just want to read that line again wow okay (laughs) agree okay here we go okay one two three vote and it's unanimous Mm. all right who would like to read the next one i I'm, I'm abstaining today i have a bit of a cold and i as you can probably hear i could read well thank you Dagny. okay castle beginning and ending with lines from tarfia faizula let me break free from these lace frail microscopic bodies My breath, always shared. Trace it back to unmasked foreign bodies. Taking that last winter deep into her lungs. Breathe, I remind her, and remember me a child, Mom, not this unrecognizable foreign body. The sky's aperture widens. Sight does not equal witness. The organ's rusty song catches in the rafters, unascended, and all this rain leaking down on us like foreign bodies. Gray fox, white cells, families fleeing one home for hopes of another. Some borders, perhaps, are meant to be trespassed by unforeign bodies. Row after perfect row equals harvest. Harvest does not equal everyone is fed, sated, breaking up from the earth beneath star thistle and bindweed to us foreign bodies. The day an autumn orphan and we're yanking roots, my daughter's tiny misgendered fingers in mine, pulling together, nobody is foreign. Beautifully read. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank nice. you. Yeah. So Slushies, you do need to look at this one for sure. There's several parentheticals, interesting punctuation. Dagny, kudos to you uh, for the does not equal. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done. I would equal. Kathy, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, <laughs> I totally forgot that's how you say that. <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness I know my math symbols. <laughs> Uh, (laughs) okay Okay. Uh, take a look uh, because a lot of interesting things are done with punctuation we've got ampersand starting sentence starting sentences it's it's uh all kinds of stuff is happening yeah brackets are used several times um i was gonna say something i really love about this is that we're getting lines from a different poet i'm assuming in the very beginning and the ending, at least that's what we're told in the title. And the whole poem is about like these recreations and reconfigurations of bodies. And 
I've been taking this class this semester on um, Ovid's metamorphosis. So this is all very much in my mind. And like the opening of that is like bodies becoming other bodies. And of course, we're also like talking about poetry with that text, but we're talking about that with this text too, right? And just that it's not just the start, the souls and, you know, all these ones that are mentioned, but it's, you know, that poet poem itself, uh, the poem itself is as well. And on one hand, I felt like, oh, that the ending line for me feels, you know, maybe a little uh, too on the nose. Um, but then I really like it when I think of it as also part of poetry. Wait, Sam, say what, say more about that. What do you mean that it's also part of poetry that like the. Sure. So um, that this body nobody mm -hmm. is foreign and like so mm -hmm. is no poem is foreign right so yeah. that it's moving yeah. uh and building on other poems and I think that's so freeing when you can yeah. think of poetry and writing that way rather than like worried about like what maybe is original or yours and belonging to you in a way oh beautiful beautiful sorry if I broke up a little bit there you didn't you're fine Right. At first, I thought this was a lot more, um, I don't know if I want to say difficult or complicated than the first one, than the one we just read. The images seemed more um, disparate, you know, but I when I kind of like relaxed into it, it went more smoothly. I... I, you know what, I agree with you, Kath, and I think it's also, Dagny did such a beautiful job reading that, but like poems with parentheticals, um, like build not just like sejuras into lines, but like asides. I always read them as like an aside, right? Yeah, um, yeah, me too. And so it's like, yeah, this, like this kind of like secrets inside secrets happening. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I, and I, I, want, I would love, it's Sam's just such a beautiful reading of the, the last line, but I would really love us to talk about that last stanza, the day an autumn orphan and we're yanking roots, my daughter's tiny misgendered fingers in mine pulling together, nobody is foreign. And the title of the poem is, is Ghazal beginning and ending with lines from Tarfia Faizula. So that last line is coming from Faizula and I, mm -hmm. I wanted, I, I'm so like drawn and perplexed by it, right? So drawn to it, perplexed by it, right? And I, I wonder what what your thoughts are on the misgendered, like misgendered fingers. Is it that it's like daughter's the wrong name for, like, is it not, a, right? Like how how is how has the daughter just been misgendered in the configuration of those lines? Yes. Yeah, particularly in such an apparently young child. Yeah, uh -huh. like the misgendering is actually from the speaker. Like the speaker is misgendering the child, right? So, I guess yeah. Yeah, that threw me. Yeah, I was just assuming that the daughter identified as a boy, and okay. that he, the speaker, is is like still processing that. Ah, uh, I see. Even though they're tiny. Yeah. 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 Could be as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. It felt it's also a little, I don't know. I mean, it could be that, but it also felt like a little bit lighter to me. Like there was something um because I thought about it in terms of like it it somehow feels um I don't know. I, I wanted to to hear it in a slightly um indeterminate way that there was something yeah. kind of open-ended about it. Because like if it's if it's you know that the daughter is a trans boy, then the daughter itself would be a misgendering. And so I right. assumed that if someone is sophisticated enough to say that um, someone's misgendered, they're sophisticated enough to use the right uh, word. And so I thought maybe there was something, or I, I experienced it as something like a little less determined and something like a little bit more to do with like a spectrum or a kind of, um, in position that is maybe not as clear in the arrival point or the end point or the proper location that kind of has to do with an openness of experience and identity. So I, I didn't really read it in quite that determined a way, I guess. Right. 
Yeah, I think that I think that makes more sense, especially with the the parenthetical after it, like even pulling and together, I feel like would make sense with that reading too. Do you think that just together, nobody is foreign is the line that's taken from Tarfia Fizula? I, I went looking just for that. this because I, um, I found the poem with the opening line. I didn't find the poem with the closing line that looked exactly or even like an approximation of this line. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Doesn't mean it's not out there. But I, yeah. Um, and also, let me just intervene for a moment and say, um, slushies, uh, imagine that we're, we're talking to Kathy's brother, Dave, <laughs> David. Tarfia Fazulu um, is, is a poet. Um, she's uh, born in Brooklyn to Bangladeshi immigrants and raised in Texas. And she's got a number of uh, books of poetry out there. And we'll add a link to her um, work and her bio in the show notes. Absolutely. It's also the case that um, because the chazal is so modular, like taking a line from someone else often is a really great starting point for a chazal. And that, that can be a really great exercise. And as long as you're attributing it, um, you're on yeah. safe ground. Um, what are we to make of that second stanza? We have the speaker addressing their own mother. And then it ends, and, it, and it's winter, taking that last winter deep into her lungs. And then in the last pair stanza, uh, we get another, you know, parent-child relationship. And the day is an autumn orphan. Mm -hmm. Do those two stanzas speak to each other? And we have the foreign body. Mm -hmm. This unrecognizable, the speaker calls their own body, unrecognizable foreign body. Right. And then the last line is nobody is foreign. Uh, what, what was the sorry? <laughs> yeah, can you the question that? is, uh, help me make sense of that. Right. Because uh, that second stanza says, remember me as a child, mom, not this unrecognizable foreign body. Which could and then be in the last paragraph, walking with the daughter, last stanza. I'm sorry, I keep saying paragraph. Last stanza walking with the daughter. So it's another parent child relationship stanza. We have together, no body is foreign. Mm -hmm. I I mean, for, for me, it had a lot to do with the fact that I was moving back into the voice of uh, Terfia Fazola, but um, it kind of arrives in found language, misgendered fingers in mind pulling together, no body is foreign. So kind of, um, moving through all of these ways in which connection and disconnection, recognition and misrecognition, yeah. the image system is highly contradictory and paradoxical, right? That the orphan is next to the daughter, the day is an orphan, but then the daughter is with the father, um, the daughter next to misgendered, right? That so, but that everyone sort of comes together, right? <laughs> that that uh, mm -hmm. it, it felt yeah. it felt to me, um, like a kind of swirl of identity, sort of a Hegelian field mm. of identity instead of a kind of um, determined set of I am this and you are that. And yeah. so I, I kind of like the way, I mean, even just yanking roots, right? That like the, mm. the notion of a family tree right. that's invoked by the father and daughter. So, so arriving kind of at no body is foreign felt um natural to me like it felt kind of um inclusive mm -hmm. that all of this is is a kind of swirl and that none of these things are highly determined all of these things are in flux right so this is a meditation on bodies or foreign bodies like the last one was a meditation on glass right so mm -hmm. we have un unmasked foreign bodies unrecognizable foreign body yeah Foreign bodies, unforeign bodies, foreign bodies, and nobody is foreign. Right. And I think there's also in that swirl, these, the parent-child relationship is is explored beautifully, right? So, you know, that let's see, um, taking that last winter deep into her lungs, breathe, I remind her, and remember me as a child mom, not this unrecognizable foreign body. It's almost as if... Um, 
like the, the, the aging child is unrecognizable to the parent, right? Um, sure, sure. Not, and that's so, it's like so beautifully um, expressed. And then if the next the next stanza, you you get the uh, configuration of sight does not equal witness, right? Which for, for me feels like part of the heart of the swirl that Jason just described, right? Because mm. if sight were witnessed, then there would be a much more deterministic sort of identification and categorizing going on here, right? Right, but right. The movement from like um, that sense of the, the beloved or the child as a foreign body to nobody being foreign is, is, um, a, is it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful meditation on inclusion and inclusivity, right? Like it's lovely, but it, it, it does take me a minute to get there. Like this poem doesn't yield easily, but boy, oh boy, is it beautiful in the way it makes me want to spend time with it. Something that, yeah, I agree. And something that I'm thinking about is I feel like there's a recognition both like in this poem and I can even think about it like outside of this poem of the swirl, right? Like I think there's some kind of recognition of that, but there's also this resistance to it because of the eye. And I think, and because of liking having a self and in this second stanza, I think is the only place we get the pronoun I. And I think it makes sense to me that there's almost this remember me or this imploring me to the mother because of that time when that is someone who looks at you maybe as an I, who like knows who you are fully like intact, like outside of the swirl, even though everywhere else there's like an, an admission of the swirl. Yeah. I, I also think it, it kind of touches on I mean, part of what I'm saying about overdetermined is a kind of polarizing perspective that, you know, comes out of our contemporary politics. And so the way in which, like, I, I really love the beginning with the lace frail microscopic bodies, trace it back to unmasked foreign bodies. And obviously, like, we can't read that without reading COVID, right? I mean, obviously, we're thinking about the way in which um, the virus itself is a foreign body. And we have a discourse which has now kind of become terrified of foreign bodies. And the way that those like fractals of difference and fractals of alienation and kind of endless multiple layers of um, the ways in which we have to recognize things as not ourselves, but also take them into ourselves and the way those things can make us sick or can make us well. Um, but I like that it doesn't, it, it it feels like it's sort of circling around in a way that I find really satisfying. And I just keep wanting to resist a kind of politicized reading that kind of ends up in a polarizing, well, did it get it right, right? Is it is it mm -hmm. this or is it that? Right. And right. I, I love the way that it's sort of like yeah. glancingly moving towards it in the same way that orphan and roots and daughter and misgender are creating these kind of paradoxical senses of how um, identity and being and movement and nature and human are working together. Um, I, I kind of feel the same way about uh, those introductions to the notion of, of foreignness, to the notion of body. And, the, and I, I just wanna keep, I, I think that the poem does a really nice job of sort of opening those spaces out instead of closing them down. And I don't wanna kind of give in to a sort of cultural imperative to shut them down or make them speak their truth. I really want to kind of right. like let that space remain really open and glancing and possible. And that silence slushies is all of us saying, amen, Jason, amen. <laughs> it's like church. Uh -uh. Did others read the organ's rusty song as, as referring back to the lungs of the mother? So the voice from the lungs, mm -hmm. it, it felt like that to me, the, the voice catching in the rafters unascended a rusty song. Dagny, for some, I, it put me in a church, right? And I was listening mm -hmm. to the organ in a church and <clears throat> I don't know if that analogy is there, um, but I can see it, right? Yeah, whether it was intended or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Billy be the timekeeper again and suggest yeah. that we vote because we do have one more. 
Yeah. Are we ready? Okay, let's do it. One, two, three, vote. And it is also in. Thank you so much, John. We're down to our last one. Who's going to do it? Maine or Sam? I'm happy to do it. If someone says cave for me, is that how you say oh, it's it? Cave. 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 Okay. Um, and especially when you take a look at this poem, you'll see why. Um, so it's called Field of Anchors for Kava Akbar. Darkness on both sides and wild grasses, sun hurt, frowning, so as not to drift too far from shore, a man palms the tiny church inside, the warm casing inside a god, prays to another god for more of himself, more devotion, one more detonation of roses, less blood next time, less field without end, or is it more that's required to make a mirror of each window, all that untilled light, all that goddamn reflection, the old maple out back, no longer, a noose swinging from it, lifts its arms in praise of its leaves, fallen and otherwise, only a god, my grandmother promised, can beat the trees of its birds, can lullaby the field mouse into paradise, only fear can, hallelujah the anchors from their green, dear less, wolf-filled moorings, or is it love, when I open the front gate, rusting, still, despite drought, despite me, I hear my children playing with blood inside the roses, inside the bullet, an impossible anchor, a darkness that gives a people its name. Great work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So slushies, this is not a, a guzzle, guzzle. Puzzle. <laughs> it, it, uh, it's very dense. There are no stanza breaks. And yeah. as you heard in Marion's excellent reading, it's filled with periods. There are maybe two a line. Yeah, or so. So mm -hmm. uh, do take a look. Um, and great job handling that, Marion. Although I have to tell you that you inserted the word mouse. Where? You said you said the field mouse into paradise. You just put that? a mouse in there. I it's put a mouse in the dog? Yeah. I put a mouse. Oh, John, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I put a mouse in your palm. <laughs> you know what? And until, you, until you called me on it, I actually would have told you I saw the word mouse. Like yeah. in my mind right now, I saw the word mouse. <laughs> yep, yep. So. So All right. this, this poem seems to be very much after gloves like have an akbar but it says it's four interesting so out of everybody around the table i'm the newbie here is four interchangeable with after or will it actually have a different meaning in this case i, I would think i i assume that he was friends with have akbar right if, if you're um writing four that it's typically four yeah um yeah, yeah. I, I would yeah. expect it after um so I, i'm assuming that they are friends Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, to answer the that, question, I don't yeah. I don't see the meaning the same for for and after yeah. to answer that question yeah. specifically. I yeah. think it is for like, you know. OK, for, for. And I'm I am the late coming jackass to this, too. Of course, Kava Akbar. I just Googled quickly. Forgive me, Kava Akbar. Um, I love calling a wolf a wolf. Now. Now I know who that poet is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So would others agree that this appears to be after gloves? Um, yeah, uh, but I would I would assume that like if it's for then it's like an act of friendship that like it's like I'm writing like after yeah. Yeah, yeah. like it's it's like a it includes after and raises it to offering. <laughs> I love that. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I, I think four is like a dedication like it this is this is to you know what I mean like um a gesture outward to the 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I just wanted to be sure I wasn't wrong about it being inclusive yeah. of an after because it definitely seems to be doing that as well. Yeah. And I love this piece. Say why, Dag? You say why? Well, often, <laughs> often these kinds of stops, the four caesuras, the would 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 slow me down too much in a in a poem. Um and and perhaps frustrate me, um, which is as much about my taste as a reader, right? But in, in this piece, I love it because I just feel I'm seeing all of these wonderful fragments and pixels and, mm. um, and, 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 and kind of being pivoted in my read to see things differently as I, as I go through it. And I mean, and, and, and just in that second line, sun hurt, something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, sun as in what shines from the sky hyphen hurt it you know that that that's worth stopping for and, and thinking about for a moment before you move on to browning so as not to drift um and 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 again being lost in in the mystery of the piece because there's a lot of mystery in it too but uh yeah I'm 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 loving the form the form feels right Bill, did you kind of already say this I'm just I'm, this is not rhetorical but maybe so why periods rather than breaks? I had a student who asked me about this um, and he asked me why, like he just sort of like questioned the very structure of sentences. Like why is um, going to the store not a sentence that we are going to the store is a sentence. Um, and, you know, and the answer is sort of like a second grade answer that, you know, like every sentence in English requires a subject, a verb and a complete thought. And, um, but we also know that that's not necessarily like, it's like, that's a useful sort of rubric, but we also do think in image. We also do think in, sure. we also do kind of, you know, and, and so to kind of interrupt it. So in some places, um, the periods are where you would expect a comma to be. And we have a full, um, thought and in other places like just the image itself kind of stands alone as an image without action and so I, I think there's sort of a really satis like and, and as you said this can, this can happen in a satisfying or an unsatisfying way and I think here the kind of refusal of sentence in favor of image that juxtaposes next to that which might form a sentence or which might not is really satisfying that kind of carries us through um, Mm-hmm. in a very different way mm-hmm. and, it, and it creates possibilities for connection that when we're dealing with a sentence and like I mean the value of punctuation is that it limits the ways in which something might be read um, the mm-hmm. point of punctuation is that it clarifies what is supposed to be indicated and so here to use the punctuation to kind of suggest that there are more possible possibilities you know is it one more detonation of roses, mm-hmm. one more detonation of roses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yeah. that there's a way in which like, like what's the relationship between the roses to the detonation? And usually you would need like an M dash to do this, right? Like the power of the M dash is that it's a break, but it's an under, it's, it doesn't tell you what the break is. But if yeah. the period has to end a complete thought or conclude a sentence or indicate abbreviation as in Mr. or Mrs. Um, if you use it, idiosyncratically or eccentrically, then it pushes you into this other space where you can now create these like glancing relationships that can be productive and exciting, which I think is what happens here. And okay, Jason, that actually helps me with thinking about the relationship between the title and the fact that every single line in this poem ends with an end stop. So even though this the sentences aren't you know, air quotes complete, right? The lines are complete, right? Um, And it creates a kind of like rat-a-tat, like like not, it's not necessarily propulsive, but it's like, it's like Mm. a drilling feeling in the, in the poem, right? Like bat, 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 every single line um, sort of on its, on its own, right? Um, And then doing the thing that you and, and Dagny just described, which is like this a kind of sort of like kaleidoscoping, right, of the images, right? The way they sort of like shift and settle, shift and settle. Um, you know, it's interesting. I see all of those periods as imposing 
as controlling, mm -hmm. right? Pretty much the opposite of how Jason's just described it as allowing the reader to make their own connections. Mm. But that doesn't mean I don't gain pleasure from it. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that amount of control and those words being the way you just described it, like boom, 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 boom. You know, there's mm -hmm. something really satisfying about all the periods. Mm -hmm. And it's called field of anchors, right? Like it's so <laughs> like what, how does like that, that seems like really right um, aligned with the form. But what the heck is this poem doing? What's, what's, what, how do you, what do you take from it? What's what's the, the the mood the idea the these images are are really um, shifting. Something that a question I have about it is the inside the bullet instead of it being the bullet because yeah. when I first read this I thought okay so each of these. Um, you know, categorized images could be a stopping point for someone like, but the bullet feels like it's not, and it's an impossible anchor, but it, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about inside the bullet. And so I guess I don't, I don't know what that is. There are definitely images here that speak to being at war, or at least being in a place where war has been present in the past. Um, and I and I believe Akbar's uh, gloves poem is is absolutely about that. Um, mm. It's of war of soldiering, um, and 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 so I came here a little more prepared to see that. But I mean, I see it right in the opening line: darkness on both sides. Um, and and then obviously there's um where we get more devotion one more detonation of roses less blood next time less field um i mean uh, for for me all of that that fits that that imagery um and i i you know i feel like i'm i'm right there with it and then and then the bullet is actually addressed at at the end of the poem but there's a casing earlier mm -hmm. in the poem yeah. as well. And yeah. same to your point about it being from inside the anger, the rage, the revenge of a bullet being inside of it, having that casing referenced earlier on as well. Um, yeah, anyway, I, I guess I'm just saying it, it does all track for me to be on, on the theme of uh, uh, of war of conflict yeah but and I'm so glad you you keep reminding us of the poem gloves too because it really is a sort of formal um conversation right like those yeah. these, those two poems really are formally in conversation um absolutely but it does this one does really feel like a meditation on you know guns and gun violence and violence and 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 well, yeah, Marion. I mean, I think that 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 absolutely needs to be said here too. This isn't this isn't um, it, it, this doesn't really feel like it's speaking about a foreign war. It feels like it's yeah. speaking more about the domestic um, yeah. experience of of gun violence that the U.S. continues to grapple with um, and pay the price for so heavily. Um, and and I mean, the poem ending with what the children are playing with. Mm -hmm. um, the blood inside them, what they're um, going to be carrying forward in their young lives. It, it definitely feels like that. Can we look at the use of anchor toward the end of the poem? Mm -hmm. The lines, only fear can, hallelujah, the anchors from their green. Mm -hmm. And then later we have the roses inside the bullet, an impossible anchor, a darkness that gives mm -hmm. a people its name. I think that really um, speaks to Dagny's reading of, of yeah. the poem. Yeah, and we don't see that title used and that word used until this, this part. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Catholic. An impossible anchor. Oh, there we are again, thinking. It's the sound of thinking. I think we need to vote i think we do okay, okay. all right let's do it. 
Okay. One, two, three, vote. <laughs> surprise, surprise. It's a unanimous yeah. yes. This is amazing. What an amazing conversation we got to have. Thank you so much, yes. John Sylvie Williams. Thank you yes. so much. So good. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have anything else to say other than thank you to each other? So I love you John. and I miss you and, and <laughs> see all of you soon, hopefully. Okay. All right. All I do. Right. I do wish we could be today. I'm. I'm. I know that I'm not going to see everyone in Seattle, and I know that I kind of needed like a little bit of time to myself and not to travel. But um, I will miss you. So please think about me while you're all having drinks. We'll be miss you. We'll keep. We'll be at the, the bar, bar going. Where's and... Jason? We'll be. The you can FaceTime me. I'll like. Jason? I'll come in. I'll come we're in for good. fake. <laughs> I won't be there for real, but you can like FaceTime me, in and I'll be like, Hoo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> How are you gonna go? How are you gonna go? You'll, you'll say what? You'll say what, Jason? I'll say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, slushies. Keep reading. Tell us how we're doing. And thank you. Woo. So good. So good.